When people die, they just go away. If there's any place a soul would go, it's in your memories. People you remember. Well, hello, hello, fun. hello, everyone. How are all of you? Hopefully, you're all doing well. this game a little bit i never finished it but i played a little bit of it at a friend's long long time ago and it's a game i've been meaning to get around to playing here John Wick, a sword fighter.
Okay. Incredibly unfair. I don't think this is what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know what else to do because it's not doing any damage. Okay, so is I just supposed to actually go back and forth between them? white bottle.
looks like the moon scratched the plane. Are you so calm about that? Like, ridiculously calm about it. my way. Hello, and thank you for the follow there, uh, Sewer Tyrant. How are you this evening? Ah, I already equipped it. Cool.
What's that do? Ah, revive. So Phoenix down. Guess we have no choice. say what it's for though. Oh well. I'm sure we'll figure that out at some point. into the boxes is good. I don't know if there's open something there with the way the map was designed. grab a card here to draw for sewer timer to follow here to put in the scrapbook. Got to bring those over since we weren't playing a PC game tonight. Wow. Oh. Last part of that pack. So we'll have to, uh, if any other events happen, we'll have to open a new pack of cards. So, let's see. For Sewer Tyrants Follow, we are going to be putting into the scrapbook. 
a moon glow bird from Force of Will. For those who live on the moon, there is no feeling of sky. However, recognizing the flying birds, it is the same as Earth. What's the flavor text on that? guy over there. He's still alive. Huh? <gasps> hey, you! What about the others? You alone? What's your yeah. name? Your unit? Apparently I don't Second talk. Lieutenant Kai Marginar, no. Commander, 17th Platoon, Armored Magic Troopers. It's a miracle you made it. Come with me. This way. Unbelievable. One survivor. Yeah. Amazing he made it out safe. Especially in that outfit. Well, I mean, he did say he was a commander, so... I figured we'd walk past some stuff, so it's a good thing I came back this way. So it doesn't give you any indication that you're able to talk to them. You just have to assume. We're pulling out! Let's move! I mean, what else am I going to do? The enemies here are shit for experience, so... That's Officer Seth Balmore with the 43rd Magic Division. She's like you. She got out in one piece. Really? You two are walking miracles. Uh. Yeah. Here, I...
Actually, the the car design reminds me a lot of uh, Charles. Here's Cold where you Seal. get off, Lieutenant. Hmm? The council wishes to hear from a survivor, sir. Sorry, not you, Officer Balmore. Hey, I'm a survivor too. The council has only summoned Lieutenant Argonar. Sit down and shut up. That's rude. Well, that's just weird. This way, Lieutenant. That was extremely rude. Okay. This, whatever that seed thing is, is the only reason to come up here. Okay, so yeah, they're not going to let me go that way. What is that seed for? Also, what are our options here for ring assembly?
another one that looks helmety. Yay for randomly pressing buttons. Okay, so I guess I have to go this way. We can do that. that can't die the 17th division that was the front line they were smack in the middle of the wall highlands no one could have survived that meteor crash but here you are without a scratch beg your pardon lieutenant but it's really strange the few we were able to save were far from the center of impact and even those men were seriously injured it's just it's hard to believe that anyone could have survived that inferno. I did. Then don't believe it. The council won't like that attitude. Who said I cared what the council thought? Come on, tell us. How'd you make it?
30 years ago, a new power manifested itself onto the world. With its discovery came the magic industrial revolution. This power came to be called magic energy. Even now, there are none who can explain why this power, a power that merely lay buried within all living creatures, suddenly flourished as it did. Today, this magic energy permeates every corner of the world. It has changed the way people live, transformed the shape of industry, and has even altered the nature of war. Is it true the Kents have requested a truce? Indeed. We heard that enough men were committed to cover the Wall Highlands and that most of the Kent force were eliminated. This war was started by them. It's only right they withdraw. We've also lost a tremendous number of troops. After suffering such a devastating loss, if the Gotha were to strike now, there would be no way we could defend our country. And there are also whispers that Gotza was pulling strings behind the invasion. What makes you think that the Gotza were involved? We have confirmed that a large amount of military hardware has been moved from Gotza to Kent. We assume Gotza plans to use Kent to keep things stirred up and destabilize Ura. Are you saying that even the meteor crash was a Gotzen plot? My lord, I have some disturbing information on that subject. We suspect that a situation at Grandstaff may have caused the meteor crash. Grandstaff? This is not the first time this story's about to reached my ears. This is not confirmed, but magic energy may have leaked out of Grandstaff, interfered with something in outer space, and precipitated this disaster. Gongora! Yes, my lord. The Grandstaff falls under your jurisdiction. Do you have anything to say? Nothing for the moment. Where did you get this information? Construction of Grand Staff is going smoothly. Now that the forces of Ura have suffered such devastating losses, I think we have no other way to protect our land except with the magic energy that Grand Staff will provide. We should hold off on debating the pros and cons of Grand Staff until we've thoroughly reviewed the world's current situation. What you say makes sense. But our plan to use magic energy is a double-edged sword. With all sorts of rumors flying around, we might want to halt construction of Grand Staff. What? Only temporarily. As soon as it's clear that Grand Staff had nothing to do with the meteor collision, we'll resume construction immediately, Gangora. Makes sense. Shiny.
Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure my chat's working here. One moment. Yeah, my chat seems to be working. I mean, you're at war, but they're generally fairly well away from it, so they don't have a concept of exactly what all is going on. Put your magical cars in my way of going down that alleyway. Well done. You may leave. Huh? Uh. Lieutenant Kaya Marganar, we thank you for a job well done. I am Roxiel, chairman of the Central Council of Ura. Well, Lieutenant, it seems people are calling you the Immortal. We've heard there were almost no survivors from Ura or Kent after the meteor crashed on the highlands. And yet, you appear to be unharmed even though you were presumably at the precise point of impact. Tell me, how did you survive? I don't know. My lord, please allow me to explain. Fine. Speak. Thank you, my lord. Actually, this man is immortal thanks to my magic energy. He is under a spell of immortality that I conjured. Hmm. I wish to know more. This immortality spell, how does it work? I don't know. 
What? Are you saying that you don't know about the spell cast on you? I don't remember. I recall nothing. My lord, uh, this man has lost his memory. However, he is skilled in magic energy. So I have been studying his abilities. Then what can you tell us, Gongora? With all due respect, my lord, Jack Squat. the spell is a curse. It is said that merely hearing it brings death near. For the safety of everyone, it is better that the spell be kept secret. Hmm. Very well. Since I trust your studied opinion, I shall take your word that we should not know the spell. Death is determined by fate, and one cannot fight it. <laughs> Lieutenant, since it seems that you cannot be killed, the Council would like to bestow a special mission on you. Oh, great. Something that would kill normal people. We want you to go to Grandstaff. My lord. Gongora, you cannot keep this hidden any longer. Till now, construction has been left up to you. But we've lost contact with the site. It's just that... Uh... Gangora! Until we can confirm that Grand Staff Project is safe, construction shall be suspended. Yes, my lord. So now, Lieutenant Argonaut, You know of Grandstaff, under construction in the Sea of Bas? I've heard that it's a magic staff. Yes, it is. As you just heard, all communications with the site have been cut off for some time now. Considering the danger from magic energy leaks, we suspect that no one can investigate the possible cause, except someone immortal. someone else what did you say at the wall highlands another immortal her name is balmor hmm? well then this other one shall accompany you i shall summon her quickly make the arrangements <laughs> right away my lord this Gungora guy is not going to be happy. My lord, pardon me for saying this. But I'm building Grand Staff for the sake of our nation and its people. And we don't care. Enough! We will await Kaim's return and report. Of course, my lord. You are dismissed, Lieutenant. Okay.
surprised there's any money in that considering this is a tavern. So purple is shops, but it doesn't seem to be here. This guy's car so blocking that. Yep. Only little kitty back there. Ah. There could be gold, there could be anything behind that poster.
Oh, there's the run button. I knew there had to be one, I just couldn't find it. Now, you allow me to run up to the door, but then you're just going to tell me as I try to open the door that I have to go away? I mean, you'd think you would stop me before I ever got to the door. That, that's some bad guarding. Well, I guess I'm done exploring here now. So I'm guessing to the end. And now, counselors, I propose that Gongora be removed from Grand Staff Project with control transferred to this council. My lord. In addition, until Lieutenant Argonar completes his investigation, I propose that Gongora be confined to his residence under surveillance. Those who disagree with my proposal, raise your hands now. It appears I have no choice but to agree. <sighs> I see there are no objections. It is decided. I have to go in and ransack each room. So I guess that's something I can learn, I guess, maybe? As 
as Kaim slips into deep sleep, his dream unfolds. A dream or his past. At this moment, there is no way he could know. The hair, the eyes. The ghost beat Belmora at a younger age. Dream has been revealed. Family members have tears in their eyes when they welcome Kaim back to the inn and affirm his long journey. Thank you so much for coming. He understands the situation immediately. The time for departure is drawing near. Too soon. Too soon. But still, he knows, this day would have to come sometime, and not in the distant future. I might never see you again, she said to him, with a sad smile when he left on this journey. Her smiling face almost transparent in its whiteness, so fragile, and therefore indescribably beautiful, as she lay in bed. May I see Hannah now, he asks. The innkeeper gives him a tiny nod and says, I don't think she'll know who you are, though. She hasn't opened her eyes since last night, he warns Kaim. You can tell from the slight movement of her chest that she's clinging to a frail thread of life. If I could snap at any moment. It's such a shame. I know you made a special point to come here for her. Another tear glides down the wife's cheek. Never mind, it's fine, Kain says. He has imprisoned innumerable deaths, and his experience has taught him much. Death takes away the power of speech, first of all, then the ability to see. What remains alive to the very end, however, is the power to hear. Even though the person has lost consciousness, it is by no means unusual for the voices of the family to bring forth smiles or tears. Kaim puts his arm around the woman's shoulders and says, I have lots of travel stories to tell her. I've been looking forward to this my whole time on the road. Instead of smiling, the woman releases another large tear and nods to Kaim. And Hannah was so looking forward to hearing your stories. Her sobs almost drown out her words. The innkeeper says, I wish I could urge you to rest up from your travels before you see her, but... Kaim interrupts the apology. Of course I'll see her right away. There is very little time left. Hannah, the only daughter of the innkeeper and his wife, will probably breathe her last before the sun comes up. Kaim lowers his pack to the floor and quietly opens the door to Hannah's room. Hannah was frail from birth. 
far from enjoying the opportunity to travel, she rarely left the town or even the neighborhood in which she was born and raised. This child will probably not live to adulthood, the doctor told her parents. To this tiny girl with extraordinary, beautiful, doll-like features, the gods held dealt an all-too-sad destiny. That they had allowed her to be born the only daughter of the keepers of a small inn by the highway was perhaps one small act of atonement for such inequity. Hannah was unable to go anywhere, but the guests who stayed at her parents' inn would tell her stories of the countries and towns, landscapes and people that she would never know. Whenever new guests arrived at the end, Hannah would ask them, Where are you from? Where are you going? Can you tell me a story? She would sit and listen to their stories with sparkling eyes, urging them on to new episodes with, And then? And then? When they left the inn, she would beg them, Please come back and tell me lots and lots of stories about faraway countries. She would stand there waving until the person disappeared far down the highway, give one lonely sigh, and go back to bed. Hannah is sound asleep. No one else is in the room, perhaps an indication that she was long since past the stage when the doctors can do anything for her. Kine sits down in the chair next to the bed and says with a smile, Hello, Hannah. I'm back. She does not respond. Her little chest still that the swelling of a grown woman rises and falls almost imperceptibly. I went far across the ocean this time, he tells her. The ocean on the side where the sun comes up. I took a boat from the harbor way, way, way far beyond the mountains. You can see from this window. And I was on the sea from the time the moon was perfectly round till it got smaller and smaller and then bigger and bigger till it was full again. There was nothing but ocean as far as the eye could see. Just the sea and the sky. Can you imagine it, Hannah? You've never seen the ocean, but I'm sure people have told you about it. It's like a huge, big, endless puddle. Kaim chuckles to himself, and it seems to him that Hannah's pale, pale white cheek moves slightly. She can hear him. Even if she cannot speak or see, her ears are still alive. Believing and hoping this to be true, Kaim continues with the story of his travels. He speaks no words of parting. As always with Hannah, Khan smiles with special gentleness he has never shown to anyone else. And he goes on telling his tales with bright voice, sometimes even accompanying his story with exaggerated gestures. He tells her about the blue ocean, about the blue sky, nothing about the violent sea battle that stained the ocean red. He never tells her about those things. Hannah was still a tiny girl when Kine visited, first visited the inn. When she asked him, Where are you from? And when you tell me some stories with her childish pronunciation and innocent smile, Kine felt a soft glow in his chest. At the time, he was returning from a battle. More precisely, he had ended one battle and was on his way to the next. His life consisted of traveling from one battlefield to another. And nothing about that has changed to this day. He has seen the lives of countless enemy troops and witnessed the deaths of countless comrades on the battlefield. Moreover, the only thing separating enemies from comrades is the slightest stroke of fortune. Had the gears of destiny turned in a slightly different way, his enemies would have been comrades and his comrades' enemies. This is the fate of the mercenary. He was spiritually worn down back then and feeling unbearably lonely. As a possessor of eternal life, Kaim had no fear of death, which is precisely why each of the soldiers' faces is sorted in fear, and why each face of a man who died in agony was burned permanently into his brain. Ordinarily, he would spend nights on the road drinking, immersing himself in an alcoholic stupor, or pretending to. He was trying to make himself forget the unforgettable. Whenever, when, however, he saw Hannah smile as she begged him for stories about his long journey. He felt a far warmer and deeper comfort than he could ever obtain from liquor. He told her many things about a beautiful flower he discovered on the battlefield. 
about the bewitching beauty of the mist filling the forest the night before the final battle. About the marvelous taste of the spring water in a ravine where he and his men had fled after losing a battle. About a vast bottomless blue sky he saw after a battle. He never told her anything sad. He kept his mouth shut about the human ugliness and stupidity he witnessed endlessly on the battlefield. He concealed his position as a mercenary from her, kept silent regarding his reasons for traveling constantly, and spoke only of things that were beautiful and sweet and lovely. Since now that he had told Hana only beautiful stories of the road like that, like this, not so much out of concern for her, her purity, but for his own sake. Saying in the inn where Hannah waited to see him turned out to be one of kind of small pleasures in life. Telling her about the memories he brought back from his journeys, he felt some degree of salvation, however slight. Five years, ten years, his friendship with the girl continued. Little by little, she neared adulthood, which meant that as the doctors had predicted each day, brought her that much closer to death. And now, Kaim ends the last travel story he will share with her. He could never see her again, he could never tell her stories again. Before dawn, when the darkness of night is at its deepest, long pauses enter into Hannah's breathing. The fa frail thread of her life is about to snap as Kaim and her parents watch over her. The tiny light that has lodged in Kaim's breast will be extinguished. His lonely journey, his lonely travels will begin again tomorrow. His long, long travels without end. You'll be leaving on travels of your own soon, Hannah, Kaim tells her gently. You'll be leaving for a world that no one knows. A world that has never entered into any of the stories you have heard so far. Finally, you will be able to leave your bed and walk anywhere you want to go. You'll be free. He wants her to know that death is not a sorrow, but a joy mixed with tears. It's your turn now. Be sure and tell everyone about the memories of your journey. Her parents will make that same journey someday. And someday Hannah will be able to meet all the guests she has known at the end far beyond the sky. I, however, can never go there. I can never escape this world. I can never see you again. This is not goodbye. It's just the start of your journey. He speaks his final words to her. We'll meet again. His final lie to her. Hannah makes her departure. Her face is transfused with a tranquil smile as if she... She has just said, see you soon. Her eyes will never open again. A single tear glides slowly down her cheek. Such a sad little story that was. You sleep well. No messages for you yet, I'm afraid. We'll hold any messages that come for you here, so please don't hesitate to take a stroll outside. I'm sure you'd like to forget the horrors of the battlefield. Oh, by the way, feel free to use any of the items you find here. They are compliments of the house. Well, I mean, I did just kind of ransack everything as is. Throat. My 
throw? Damn! Why are you following me? You... You're... You're Kai Marganar! I, I mean, Lord Gagor asked me to do it! It's the truth! I'm supposed to tell you to go to his manor. He has something important to... to tell you! You are? <coughs> Jansen. Messenger for Lord Gengora. <laughs> At your service. Man, what an attitude. Jeez whiz. Uh. Get back yet? Does not appear to be. You move your damn car. Another memory. The dream has been revealed. I'm going to need a drink. My throat's parched. Okay. Lovely white flowers mark the town. They bloom on every street corner. Not in beds or fields set aside for their cultivation, but blending naturally and in profusion with every row of houses. 
as if the buildings and the blossoms have grown up together. The season is early spring, and snow still lingers on the nearby mountains. But the stretch of ocean that gently laps the town's southern shore is bathed, is bathed in refulgent sunlight. This is an old and prosperous harbor town. Even now, each day its piers see many cruise ships and freighters come and go. Its history, however, is sharply divided between the time before and the time after, an event that happened one day long ago. People here prefer not to talk about it. The watershed engraved upon the town's chronology. The memories are too sorrowful to make stories out of them. Kaim knows this, and because he knows it, he has come here once again. Passing through, the tavern master asks him. The sound of his voice, Kaim responds with a faint smile. You're here for the festival, I suppose. You should take your time and enjoy it. The man is in high spirits. He has joined his customers in glass after glass. Until now, and is quite red in the face, but no one shows any signs of blaming him for overindulging. Every seat in the tavern is filled, and the air reverberates with laughter. Happy voices can be heard now and then as well from the off road outside. The entire town is celebrating. Once each year, the people have the festival has people making merry all night long until the sun comes up. I hope you've got a room for the night, sir. Too late to find one now. Everyone, every inn is full to overflowing. So it seems. Not that anyone would be foolish enough to spend a night like this quietly tucked away under the covers in his room. Tavern Master winks at Kaim as if to say, Not you, sir, I'm sure. Tonight we're going to have the biggest, wildest party you've ever seen, and everybody's invited. Locals or not, drink, food, gambling, women, just let me know what you want. I'll make sure you have it. Kaim sits, sips his drink and says nothing. Because he's planning to stay awake all night. He has not taken a room. There's no place to join the festival either. Kaim will be offering up a prayer at the hour before dawn, when the night is at its darkest and deepest. He will leave the town, sent off by the morning sun as it pokes its face up between the mountains and the sea. Just as he did the time of his last visit, back then, the tavern master, who a few minutes ago was telling one of his regular customers that his first grandchild was about to be born, was himself just an infant. This one's on me. Drink up, says the tavern master. Filling Kynes' shot glass, he peers at Kynes suspiciously and says, you did come for the festival, didn't you? No, not really, says Kaim. Don't tell me you didn't know about it. You mean you came here by pure chance? Afraid so. Well, if you come here on business, forget it. You'll never get serious talk out of anybody on a special night like this. The Tavern Master goes on to explain what is so special about this night. You must have heard something about it. Once a long, long time ago, this town was almost completely destroyed. There are two kinds of events that divide history into before and after. One is birth, or death, of some great personage, a hero, or a savior. The other is something like a war, a plague, or a natural disaster. What divided this town's history into before and after was a violent earthquake. It happened without warning and gave the soundly sleeping pe people of the town no chance to flee. A crack opened in the earth like a roar, and roads and buildings just fell to pieces. Fire started and they spread in the twinkling of an eye. Almost everyone was killed. <laughs> you probably can't imagine it. All I know is what they taught me in school. And what does Resurrection Festival mean to a kid? It was just something that happened once upon a time. I live here, and that's all it means to me. So a traveler like you probably can't even begin to imagine what it was like. Is that what they call this holiday? Resurrection Festival? Uh-huh. The town was resurrected from a total ruin to this. That's what the celebration is all about. Kaim gives the man a grim smile and sips his liquor. 
What's so funny, the tavern master asks. Last time I was here, they were calling it Earthquake Memorial Day. It wasn't a festival this kind of wild celebrating. What are you talking about? It's been the Resurrection Festival since ever since I was a kid. That was before you were old enough to remember anything. Huh? And before that, they called it the Consolation of the Spirits. They'd burn a candle for each person who died and pray for them to rest in peace. It was a sad festival, lots of crying. Some of you saw it happening yourself. Well, I did. The tavern master laughs with a loud snort. You look sober, but you must be plastered out of your mind. Now listen, it's the fe it's festival night, so I'm going to let you off the hook for pulling my leg. But don't say stuff like that in front of the other townspeople. All of our ancestors, mine included, are the ones who barely escaped with their lives. Time knows full well of what he is doing. He never expected the man to believe him. He just wanted to find out for himself whether the townspeople were still handing down the memories of the tragedy, whether deep down behind their laughing faces there still lingered the sorrow that had passed down from their forefathers' time. Called away by one of his other customers, the tavern master leaves Kaim's side, but not without first living a warning. Be careful what you say, sir. That kind of nonsense can get you in trouble, really. Think about it. The earthquake happened all of 200 years ago. Kaim does not answer him. Instead, he sips his liquor in silence. Among the ones who died in the tragedy 200 years ago were his wife and daughter. Of all the dozens of wives and cho hundreds of children that Kaim had, has had in his eternal life, the wife and child he had here were especially unforgettable. In those days, Kaim had a job at the harbor. There were just the three of them, he, his wife, and their little girl. They lived simply and happily. The same kind of days that preceded today would continue on into endless tomorrows. Everyone in the town believed that, including Kaim's wife and daughter, of course. But Kaim knew differently. Precisely because his own life was long without end and he had consequently tasted the pain of countless partings, Kaim knew all too well what in, that in the daily life of humans there was no forever. This life his family was living would have to end sometime. It could not go on unchanged. This was by no means a cause for sorrow, however. Denied a grasp upon forever, human beings knew how to love and cherish the here and now. Kaim especially loved to show his daughter flowers. The more fragile and short-lived, the better. Flowers that bloomed with the morning sun and scattered before the sun went down. They were everywhere in this harbor town. Lovely white flowers that bloomed in early spring. His daughter loved the flowers. She was a gentle child who would never break off blossoms that struggled so bravely to bloom. Instead, she simply watched them for hours at a time. That year, too. Look how big the buds are. They'll be blooming any time now, she said happily when she found the white flowers in the road near the house. Tomorrow, maybe? Kind wondered aloud. Absolutely, his wife chimed in merrily. Get up early tomorrow morning to have a look. Poor little flowers, though, said the daughter. It's nice when they bloom, but then they wither right away. All the better. It's good luck if you get to see them blooming. That makes it more fun. Maybe from, for us, answered the girl. But think about the poor flowers. They work so hard to open up, and they weather that same day. It's sad. Well, yes, I guess so. A momentary air of sadness flowed into the room, but Kaim quickly dispelled it with a laugh. Happiness is not the same thing as longevity, he proclaimed. What does that mean, Papa? It may not bloom for long. But the flower's happy if it can open up with the prettiest blossom and give off the sweetest perfume it knows how to make while it is blooming. The girl seemed to be having trouble caressing this and suddenly nodded with a little sigh. She then broke into a smile and said, It must be true if you say so, Papa. Your smile is more beautiful than any flower in full bloom. You should have said it to her. Kind later regretted that he had not. The words he had uttered so carelessly he came to realize turned out to be something of a prophecy. Well now, young lady, 
If you're getting up early to see the flowers tomorrow morning, you better go to bed right now. All right, Papa, if I really have to. I'm going to bed now, too, said Kime's wife. Okay, then. Good night, Papa. His wife said to Kime, Good night, dear. I really am going to bed now. Good night, Kime replied, enjoying one last cup to ease the day's fatigue. These turned out to be the last words the family shared. Earthquake struck the town before dawn. Kaim's house collapsed in a heap of rubble. Kaim's two loved ones departed for that distant other world before they could awaken from their deep sleep and without ever having a chance to say good morning to him. The morning sun rose on a town that had been destroyed in an instant. Amid the rubble, the flowers were blooming. The white flowers that Kaim's daughter had wanted to see so wanted so badly to see. Kaim thought to lay a flower and offering on his daughter's cold corpse, but abandoned the idea. He could not bring himself to pick a flower. No one, no living being on the face of the earth, he realized, had the right to snatch the life of a flower that possessed that life for only one short day. Kaim could never say to his daughter, You go first to heaven and wait for me. I'll be there before long. Nor would he ever know the joy of reunion with his loved ones. To live for a thousand years meant bearing the pain of a thousand years of parting. Kaim continued his long journey. A dizzying number of years and months flew by. Years and months during which numberless wars and natural calamities scourged the earth. People were born and they died. They loved each other and departed from the ones they loved. There were joys beyond measure and sorrows just as measureless. People fought and argued without end, but they also loved and forgave each other endlessly. Thus was history built up as the tears of the past evolved, gradually into prayers for the future. Time continues long journey. After a while, he rarely thought about the wife and daughter with whom he had spent those few short days in the harbor town, but he never forgot them. Time continues his long journey, and in the course of his travels, he stopped by this harbor town again. As the night deepened, the din of the crowds only increased, but now as a hint of light comes into the eastern sky without a signal from anyone, the noise gives way to silence. Kaim has been standing in the town central square. The revelers, too, have found their way here one at a time. Until, almost where he knows it, the stone paved plaza is filled with people. Kaim feels a tap on the shoulder. I didn't expect to find you here, says the tavern master. When Kaim gives him a silent smile, the tavern master looks somewhat embarrassed and says, There's something I forgot to tell you before. Oh? Well, you know, the earthquake happened a long time ago. Before my father and mother's time, even before my grandparents' generation. It might sound funny for me to say this, but I can't imagine this town in ruins. I know what you mean. I do think, though, that there are probably things in this world that you can remember even if you haven't actually experienced them. Like the earthquake. I haven't forgotten it. I'm not the only one. It may have happened 200 years ago, but nobody in this town has ever forgotten it. We can't imagine it, but we can't forget it either. Just Kaim nods again to signal his understanding of the tavern keeper's words. A somber melody echoes throughout the square. This is the hour when the earthquake destroyed the town. All the people assembled here close their eyes, clasp their hands together, and offer up a prayer. The tavern master and Kaim among them. To Kaim's closed eyes came the smiling face of his dead wife and daughter. Why are they so beautiful and so sad? These faces that believe with all their hearts that tomorrow is sure to come. The music ends. The morning sun climbs above the horizon, and everywhere throughout the town bloom countless white flowers. In 200 years, the white flowers have changed. The scientists have hypothesized that the earthquakes may have changed the nature of the soil itself. 
But no one knows the cause for sure. The lives of the flowers have lengthened. Where before they would bloom and wither in the space of a single day, now they hold their blooms for three and four days at a time. Moistened by the dew of night, bathed in the light of the sun, the white flowers strive to live their lives to the fullest, beautifying the town as if striving to live out the portion of life denied to those whose tomorrows were snatched away from them forever. I'm really hoping not all his memories are that sad. Lord Tolton is currently visiting. Please wait a little longer. But I, I, I got shit to do. I, I'm not going to sit here and wait for some lord. I mean, get his high patootie out of there. House arrest is going too far. I have firmly opposed Roxian on this. Do not despair, Gongora. Thank you, Your Majesty. It is much more than I could have asked. Your father would have been pleased. I could never fill my father's shoes. And now that Ura is a Republic, I am simply a citizen like everyone else. I am no longer Your Majesty. I respect the royal blood that flows in your veins. It is only fitting that I offer the respect your due. Do not be foolish. People will think you're a dissident who wants to restore the monarchy. Nah, I'm thinking he wants to, though. I'm truly happy that you have come to see me. You've always been so kind. You taught me the rudiments of magic. I cannot help but be kind to you in return. I cannot understand Roxian. I believe he intends to stop work on Grand Staff. It makes me angry, Gongora. Our entire nation has benefited from magic energy, yet he does not understand the significance of Grand Staff. If we can increase magic energy with Grand Staff, just think how much better our people's lives would be. We would no longer need soldiers. You have seen the future of Ura, and how Grand Staff can make it happen. Roxian's vision is too narrow for our nation to grow. I am sorry you had to witness that. There is no need to apologize. I'm happy your highness understands. But even if they stop Grand Staff, we could develop a newer and far better magic engine. Please let me know what you need, Gongora. I can help you. I am unworthy, Your Highness.
please, go in. That looks like a hidden stairwell to me. Don't know how to make it work, but... Come on.
Good. You're here. I ask you here for only one reason. Hold on. What is it? Oh, oh no. Great, here he comes. <gasps> Hey, whoa, 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 hey, hey, you are really short-tempered. Hey, I don't have a sword, okay? Easy. Why are you here? I told you I'm just a messenger. I, I came to see you if you here? really come or not, which you have, so that's good. That's enough, Kaim. He's on our side. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. A little late, though. We can use him. He's cunning and quick, and he has many connections. I want you to take him on your investigation of Grand Staff. No way, sir. You know I thought he'd say that, my lord. <laughs> His shoes, hello? Look, this other immortal joining the investigation, she might be dangerous. Why? The woman was once a pirate. I don't know how it happened, but she's now a soldier for our army. Well, the past is the past, and I know little else about her. Take uh -huh. Jensen with you. He can help keep her in check. Despite oh. what else he may be, he has a healthy respect for women. Ah. <sighs> sure he does. So, you know, I heard she was a looker, if you catch my drift. I mean, you've seen her, right? Okay, okay, be that way. <sighs> you guys are way too serious. Hmm. Pirate. All right. Understood. All right, then. I'll be there early. Oh, yeah, you can count on it. Remember, Kaim. You're the only one I can trust. Uh-huh. But I don't trust you. I can't leave here for a while. The Grand Staff is my life's work. So if something is wrong, I want you, with your immortal powers, to find out what it is. Understood? You'll be briefed later. You should go now. I'll be right behind you. Oh, he's gonna be fun to work with. This is for your trouble. Wow, nice. You know, my lord, I've been thinking, uh, working with this guy, uh, it's like playing with fire. I mean, did you see his eyes? I mean, that's creepy. I got a bad feeling about this whole thing. I mean, this little guarantee is not gonna be enough, I'm afraid, to keep an eye on him. You're gonna have to give me a little bit more. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. You're already under a magic contract. Don't get greedy. Wow! Whoa, hey, okay, that's some serious mojo. Easy, easy. Is your fee still unsatisfactory? Okay, not funny. I'm not laughing, okay? I didn't stick my neck out for this, okay? Jeez, everyone's a pain in the ass. Bath. Hmm. I need to get from here. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. I heard about the Grand Staff investigation. 
Looks like we both got the short end of the stick. It's not enough that we just keep surviving, eh? There's always something. So, what did you learn in the council? Nothing to do with you. <laughs> really? Say, haven't we met somewhere before? Hmm? Ugh. Nothing to worry about if you can't remember. Neither can I. You too, huh? <laughs> I can't recall a thing. All I know is that my name seems to be Seth Balmore. <sighs> People say I used to be a pirate. <sighs> Isn't it strange that both of us lost our memory and are immortal? <laughs> Maybe we met a long time ago. I sort of get that feeling when I look at you. Hmm. When we met before, were we enemies? Or allies? Or maybe even... Lovers? <laughs> <laughs> She's Looking an entertaining to character. starting our journey tomorrow, Kaim Arganar. Tomorrow? You still haven't been contacted by the council? You set out for Grand Staff tomorrow morning. I thought you would have heard by now. Oh, and by the way, I'll be joining you on your little trip. So you are going with me then? Being late is strictly forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's like, okay, whatever. This guy back yet. Guys, that made it sound more like it wasn't tomorrow. It was, uh, like now.
Why aren't we leaving? We should have already been gone by now. I'm waiting for somebody. What? Who? There's somebody else on the team. Huh? I haven't heard about that. I have. Other guy? Yeah. Whoa, baby. What a oh, I can't believe my love. Drink some booze. Why are you late? Can't you tell? A man's gotta do certain things before leaving on a mission like this, and I know what I had to do. Thank you, my lovely. Do or die, Johnson is now off to meet certain death. Oh, no, no, I miss you. Oh, Jensen, come back to us. We still have that bar. Oh, that is so you. sweet. I know, I know. Oh, don't say that. That's so nice. Hey, oh, you girls, I'm already missing you. Hey, can I have just 15 more minutes? I need 15 for her, for her, and her. That's 45 minutes. Good. That's all back to Like we would wait for you, you worthless drunk. That hurt. You poor bad. things. I think I you know what? Good. You're free to go. I, I, Thanks oh. for bringing uh. him to us. Uh. Uh -huh. well, well, thank you. Oh, You're such I a doll. You come and play with us next time, honey. Hey, hey. don't touch me. Get out of here. <laughs> Shoot. Oh, that's not very nice. Okay, bye, bye, girl. Don't cry. I'll be back. Don't worry. Okay. Bye again. <sighs> Great. Just what we need. More useless hey, baggage. Hey, hey, that's not nice. I ain't gonna come in real handy. You know, you can count on it. <sighs> Whoa! Hey. Who's counting on what? what? Oh. Ow. <sighs> hey. Man, you are so angry. What is your problem? Hey, uh... You ready? <laughs> the question is, are you... you
Ragnarok are just gonna fall. This is like a death march. Hey, we gotta get through that? Uh, there's no road! Get yourself together. If this is all it takes to wear you out, we're in trouble. Yeah, well, I don't wear out in bed. Once we get through here, there's the Ypsilon Range. Those mountains are steep and rugged. The weather is unpredictable. And since the ground is unstable, we have to be on the lookout for rock slides, too. Of course, I expect to see you take a tumble into the canyon before we see any rocks doing it. <laughs> yeah, funny. You know, Lord Gungora was saying you have a problem with your memory, right? I mean, you sure know these mountains well enough. And of course, you know you shave your legs every day and you pluck your eyebrows, and you owe me money. So, I, I'm confused. You sure you really don't remember? My body remembers. What? There was a time when I used to rush through here. I was a pirate, and supposedly I also went through these mountains. But I just don't know what the truth is. I don't have any answers. Huh. Well, what about you? Did anyone tell you what you once were? No. Nothing? Nothing. Well, since you're so upbeat and happy, I doubt if anyone will remember you. That's fine with me. Oh? My body also remembers. How so? Just that it was painful. If I happen to remember, and my past didn't amount to much, then I think it's probably better to have never remembered. Oh, yeah. That's smart. Kaim, there's no need to rush it. Your memories will come back gradually. And they're not all bad. Hmm. What? That's no like... breaks? You no just breaks. had one. Yeah, how about some water? A little fruit? How about a foot massage? My feet don't stink. Kaim, you up for that? Hello?
Let's take him down. got some experience from that. Actually, I should have healed before going in. Are you some kind of beast?
hard, eh? Did I run this trail already? I think I did, but we'll just do it again this week.
very fun. Take it now.
least now we're getting the stuff that actually gets some decent experience. this once, okay? Will you listen? Uh, all right already. What do you want? Ah, uh, whining. Okay. Is that all you can say? Can't we just rest in that hut over there? All you do is complain, complain, complain. Like you too, I'm a normal human being. What should we do? All right, let's rest. Thank you.
why not? Listen, if either Kaim or Seth seem like they're starting to regain even a fragment of their memories, use this. What is it? Uh, oh, hi. I couldn't sleep. I'm... Usually exercising, you know, sparring with people, and that I work out a lot before I... Was that all? W was what, what all? About what? You know I mean, what I mean. Yeah. Well, no, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? Hmm. How to act suspicious without acting suspicious. Good morning, Kai. Once we leave here, we'll almost be at the peak. Let's get moving. Actually, since I just got... I found all those new goodies. feels humid. Well, it's not going to rain. I know the weather. I have a sense about these things. And the sun's going to break through any second, and you'll be peeling off the clothes. Trust me. Oh, great. It's raining. what I say? It's going to rain. I knew it. Man. You're thinking the exact opposite. You're dismissed. Oh, Lord Gungora, 
Please wait. Pardon the intrusion. Oh! Gungora, what are you doing? A moment, please. What is going on, Gongora? Answer me! The Council has placed you under house arrest! Behold! Who do not wish the monarchy restored to power. But I... I do not wish it to be restored to power. With all due respect, uh, while some fools completely support our current republic, there are also those who long to restore a powerful monarchy. Regardless of what your highness may desire, our country struggles with two political forces, the past and the present. You must be aware of this. Hmm. Yep. Fortunately, I was able to sense your danger through magic energy. Uh -huh. Even though I am under house arrest, I could not allow you to be harmed. There are many ways I can secretly move from my manor to yours, your highness. But if Roxian knew you had been out of your home, you would be subject to even tighter restrictions. I can look after myself. I, however, cannot. Had you not come, I would have ended up like... like that mouse. You can always rely on me, Your Highness. No, Thank no, you, you really can't. Thank you. Of course we're going to dream. The upstreamers. Strong winds have always blown across this vast grassy plain. Perhaps the area's topography has something to do with it, but the direction of the wind remains constant, irrespective of the time or season, from east to west, from the horizon where the sun rises to the horizon where she sun, where the sun sets. Swept by the increasing winds, the misshapen trunks and branches of shrubs all incline to the west. Tall grasses do not grow here. And the grasses that do grow all lie flat on the ground. Bending westward, caravans and herding folks traverse the single road that crosses the plain. They do not come and go. They only go, moving from east to west, using the wind at their backs to gain distance. Travelers heading west to east always use the circuitous route the snakes around the southern mountains. It is much further that way, but much faster than crossing the plain head-on into the wind. 
The road across the plain is called the wind stream. Just as the flow of a great river never changes direction, the footsteps of those who use the road have not changed. Have not changed direction since the distant past, nor are they likely to change far into the distant future, from east to west. Human shapes that appear from the horizon where the sun rises disappear over the horizon where the sun sets. They never pass oncoming travelers, with only the rarest exceptions. The first time she passed Kaim on the windstream, the girl was just an infant. So was my grandmother alive then? In response to the girl's untroubled question, Kaim smiles and answers, She was. And I remember what a nice old lady she was, too. Looking back down the road, the girl points towards toward the line of hills fading off into the distance. My grandmother crossed seven hills on her journey. Is seven a lot? Uh-huh. Grandma lived a long time. Most people end their journeys after five hills. The people they leave behind build a little grave where they ended their journey, and then they keep traveling. The girl points down at the ground where she's standing. This is as far as I've come, she says with a proud smile. The religion of the girl and her family professes a pious belief that if they devote their lives to walking eastward against the flow of the wind stream, they will arrive at the easternmost source of the stream itself. People call believers in that religion the upstreamers. The word carries a hint of fear and sadness, but also a trace of contempt and scorn. The upstreamers are devoid of worldly desires. They live their lives for no greater purpose than traveling eastward on foot. They are free of doubt. They give birth to children en route, and they continue their journey while raising their children. When they age and their strength gives out, their journey ends. But their family's journey continues. From child to grandchild to great-grandchild, their belief is carried on. The journey of this girl's family was begun by her late grandmother, who began walking from the Windstream's western verge with her son, who was then the age the girl is now. The upstairs do not walk for the entire year, of course. During the season when the winds are especially strong from late autumn to early spring, they take up residence in various post towns scattered along the road and earn day wages by performing tasks that the townsfolk themselves refuse to do. Some upstreamers choose to stay in the towns, while others, conversely, take townspeople with them when they return to the road in the spring. These are the people with whom they have fallen in love during the long winter, or boys who dream of travel, or perhaps who have tired of town life. Such are the reasons town, folks look, town folk look upon the upstreamers with complicated gazes. The little girl's mother was one of those who joined the journey midway, and the girl herself some years from now might fall in love with someone in a post town somewhere. She might choose to live in the town, or she could just as well invite her lover to join her on the road. She has no idea at this point what lies in store for her. The girl's father calls out to her, time to go. Their brief rest is over. She seems sorry to leave and stands up reluctantly. Too bad, she says. I wish I could have talked to you more. But we'll have to get to the next town by the time the snow starts. Constantly exposed to headwinds, her cheeks are red and cracked, her lips chapped, but her smile is wonderful as she wishes Kaim a safe journey. It is the serene smile of one who believes completely in the purpose of her life, without the slightest doubt. Will I see you again tomorrow, she asks? Probably. Kaim answers, smiling back at her, but he never matched that smile of hers. He is now in the midst of a journey that will take him beyond the western end of the windstream. He heads to the battlefield as a mercenary, and by the time the western battle is over, a new battle will have begun in the east. It will be a long, cruel journey with nothing to believe in. When he meets the girl again along the way, comes my own have taken on even more shadows than it has now.
Perhaps as a parting gift of sorts, the girl sings a few short lines for him. This wind, where does it blow from? Where does it start its journey here? Does it come from where life begins, or does it begin where life ends? Goodbye, then, the girl says, trudging on, one labor step at a time, hair streaming in the headwind. Ten long years have flowed by when Kai meets the, next meets the girl. It is spring. The grassland is dotted with lovely white flowers. She's become the wife of a young man who does tailoring and shoe repair in one of the post towns. This is my third spring here, she says, patting her swollen belly fondly. In a few days, she'll give birth to a child. She'll become a mother. And your parents, Kai asks. She shrugs and glances eastward. They are continuing their journey. I'm the only one who stayed on here. Kaim does not ask why she has done this. Continuing the journey is one way to live, and staying in town is another. Neither can be judged to be more correct than the other. The only answer for the girl can be seen in her smiling face. But never mind about me, she says, looking at him suspiciously. You haven't changed one little bit from the time we met so long ago. For the thousand-year-old Kime, ten years is nothing but a change in season. Some lives are like that, he says, straining to smile. Some people in this world can never grow old, no matter how long they live. He looks at the girl, now grown into woman, and wonders again. Living through endless ages of time, is it a blessing or a curse? Kind's remark hardly counts as an explanation, but the girl nods with a look of apparent understanding. If that's the case, she says, you should be the one who goes to the place where the wind begins. You'd be the perfect upstreamer. She could be right, after all. The lifespan given to humans is far too short for anyone to travel against the flow of the wind stream. As far as the starting point of the wind... Still, Kai responds with a few slow shakes of his head. I'm not qualified to make the journey. No, anybody can be an upstreamer. Anybody that is, who wants to see where the wind starts with his own, his or her own eyes. Having said this, however, the girl adds with a touch of sadness, no one has actually seen it though, I guess. The place where the wind begins, that place is nowhere at all. Even if after a long journey one were to arrive at the eastern end of the wind stream, the wind would be blowing there too, and not just an east wind, west wind, north wind, south wind, winds without limit, without end. Human beings who cannot live forever, daring to take a journey without end. This might be the ultimate tragedy, but it could just as well be the ultimate comedy. Kaim knows one thing, however. One cannot simply dismiss it as an exercise in futility. How about you, he asks the girl. Aren't you going to continue your journey soon? She thinks about this for the space of a breath and caressing her swollen belly. She cocks her head and says, I wonder. I might want to go on living this the way I am now forever. Or then again, I might feel the desire to reach that the starting point of the wind. All the upstreamers, without exception, say that you never know what might trigger a return to the journey. One day without warning, you slough off the entire town life and start walking. It's not always a matter of running into an upstreamer and being lured back to the road. Plenty of people set out on their own, and all of a sudden... The teachings of the upstreamers say that all human beings harbor a desire for endless travel. They probably are not aware of the desire because it's stashed away so far down in the breast that it is deeper than memory. The instant something brings it to the surface, a person becomes an upstreamer. Even you have the desire, the girl says to Kaim. I wonder. It's true, she says. No question. The look in her eyes is as straight on and as free of doubt as it was the last time we met her. Fixing with that look, she points to her own chest. 
I haven't completely lost it myself. But I'm sure you're happy with your present life. Of course I am. Do you really think the day will come when you want to set out on the journey, even if it's giving up the happiness? Seven answer and she gives him a gentle smile. Many years flew by, but every now and then, something reminds Kaim of the girl's words that everyone harbors a desire for endless travel. For Kaim, living itself is a journey without end. In the course of a journey, he has witnessed countless deaths, he has also witnessed countless births. Human life is all too short, too weak and fleeting, yet the more he dwells upon its evanescence, the more he feels inexplicably that words such as eternal and perpetual apply more properly to life, finite as it is, than to anything else. Traveling down the wind stream for the first time in many years, Kaim spies the funeral of an upstreamer. A young boy in mourning dre dress stands by the road, holding out wildflowers to pass passing travelers and offering them to offer up a flower to a noble soul who has made the long journey this far. Kaim takes the flower and asks the boy, Is it a member of your family? Uh huh, my grandma. The boy nods, his face the image of one kind knew so long ago. The old woman lying in her coffin must be the girl. Kaim is sure of it. Grandma traveled a long, long time. She brought my daddy with her when he was just a little boy. See that hill over there? She started walking from way, way beyond it, and she got all the way here. So the girl must have set on her journey after all. Turning her back on the town life, leading her child by the hand, she trod her way along the endless journey. Her wish to aim for the place where the wind begins would be passed on to her child, her grandchild, and on through succeeding generations. To head for a land one could never hope to reach, and to do so generation after generation. This is another endless journey. Is it a tragedy? A comedy? Perhaps the serene smile on the face of the old woman in the coffin is the answer. Kaim lays the flower at her feet as an offering. The family members who have traveled with her join together in a song for the departed. This wind, where does it blow from? Where does it start its journey here? Does it come from where life begins? Or does it begin where life ends? The wind blows. It sweeps across the vast grassland. Kaim takes one long, slow, slept, uh, uh, slow step toward his destination. Have a good trip, calls the boy. Red and cracked as the girls were so long ago. His cheeks soften in a smile as he waves to the parting traveler. Well, at least that one wasn't as sad as the last couple of memories. But this wind is, or this rain is certainly depressing. If it's a fight you want, you got it.
get out of the rain. Although now we're going to be looking for a save point when we'll call it a night here. I'm guessing grand that's the grand staff. staff. That little bush is oh, that grand staff! That light has got to be magic energy. The staff must be leaking. That can't be I've good. I've seen that. I've seen that somewhere. Seen it? Where? Deja vu? Or maybe your memory's coming back. No, no, no. Maybe what you've forgotten you're remembering. What? Well, excuse me for helping. You are such a pain. Okay, fine. Look at the view. I'm gonna go ahead and fix everything. You just talk amongst yourselves. You really seen this before? What do you mean by that? Just what I said. Do you feel like you've seen this before? What's with you? Just trying to be a friend. Don't look at me like that again. But I thought you... <sighs> Forget it. Hey, hey, hey. All right, come on, you two. I thought we were in a rush. Oh, 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 oh. What the heck is that? Not be good, I'll say that.
Okay. Yeah, we're heading back down the mountain because we're going to have to do some. Uh, we're going to, have to do some level grinding. I am not prepped for that. If it's a fight you want, you got it. So this is just gonna be a long trek back and forth as I level grind. Which I'm gonna do off stream here. Let's take a look at who's out there to raid.
Big Bob Regard. Are you some kind of beast? Thank you all for joining us here tonight. Uh, tomorrow night we will be playing Destiny 2 as the new season starts. Tomorrow. And then uh, we will back to Lost Odyssey on Wednesday night. Uh, Till then, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening.